What is artificial intelligence? Well, it makes it possible for machines to not only learn from uh, their own experiences. TikTok poses as a Mr. Rogers neighborhood, but it acts like Big Brother. I think that encapsulates it very, very clearly. What I do think will come out of that will be some relatively significant data privacy legislation that will pass. We're going to begin tonight with a subject that's been deeply in the news, but one that most people still don't understand artificial intelligence. So far, the stories have been almost all about why we should fear AI. Stories that go so far as to suggest the AIs of the world could take over the world. Though, as we said, most people really don't have a real understanding of what it is, what it does, and why we should love it, hate it, or simply just accept it. So joining us is Paul Powers, the CEO of FISNA. He's a technology and cybersecurity expert, and he's here to walk us through it all. Paul, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. So save me the time of reading AI for Dummies. Tell us exactly, you know, <laughs> concisely what it is. What is artificial intelligence? Well, it's exactly what the name suggests. At the broadest sense, uh, the, it's an umbrella term for any technology that mimics or even improves upon human behavior. So an AI program is going to feel like you're interacting with a human or it's doing something that you traditionally think of as a human uh, activity rather than something that is overly, you know, simply computational. Like if you're just simply uh, enter numbers into a calculator that you know, you wouldn't consider that to be AI. But if you're able to have a conversation, say with ChatGPT, for instance, um, or you're able to have something generated based off of an idea that you have that you've written down, uh, and there are, of course, many other examples, but those would both fall into the bucket of AI. It's emulating uh, human um, intelligence in a way. So why was it actually created initially? What was it, its purpose? Well, it makes it possible for machines to not only learn from uh, their own experiences and, fr and from data that's out there, but that would be could be considered machine learning. Um, but also, you know, and adjust to new inputs, and um, it it's es essentially makes um, uh, makes for a, a much more powerful tool, right? Uh, 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 an example would be if you've ever interacted with ChatGPT versus like a Google search. This is why Bing wants ChatGPT from OpenAI in Bing now, uh, because it's it's just so much more powerful. You're able to have a, just a regular conversation. And if you, instead of, you know, having to look for keywords and then hoping that you're finding the right thing, you can say, hey, tell me who the 10 most uh, you know, famous baseball players were in the 1990s and who had the most home runs and all that information will just come out versus, um, and it'll come out conversationally versus, uh, you know, you having to search for it. And so if you think about um, the applications in, beyond just the, um, the, the creative aspect uh, or, or beyond just the text aspect, and you think about it in terms of uh, automatically generating images, uh, 3D models, for example, something that we're very focused on, um, What's really amazing about AI is that it actually acts as an equalizer in a sense. It, it is a human augmentation, if you will. It automates things that um, a computer can automate, but it does it in a way that feels much more intuitive to a human. So it's it's a, it's, it's an, uh, almost an inevitable uh, next step in technology, not something to be afraid of, something that is a long time coming. And now with our compute power that we have, it's finally starting to show up. So in the imaginary family of four in the future, in practical terms, how would they use AI on a daily basis? I'll give you an example of how I've used it uh, just recently. Uh, I was curious to see what happened. I went to, again, not to overhype on chat GPT, it's just that it's a very uh, you know, popular topic at the moment, but I wanted to know what would chat GPT tell me about the future of AI? And I wanted to make us more specific than that so it wouldn't be something that was like pre-programmed. So I said, what do you think about the future of AI as it pertains to the automatic generation of 3D models? And uh, it put together an article uh, and I actually published it. I, I, I copy pasted it and I was obvious, I was clear with everybody. I said, hey, this is from chat GPT. This is what I asked, this is what it put out. But it did an amazing job. It put together an article that explained not only the benefits of AI, but also some of the you know, legitimate risks. Like it's important to make sure that there's, um, when you're generating models, you're not infringing on other people's intellectual property, for instance, right? So things like, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's the day in my life. For a family of four, I think what you'll find is a lot of people will use it to uh, do their homework. This is a real thing. People, and I understand that. <laughs> I wish I had it when I was in school. <laughs> it's really good at doing, you know, doing your essays for you and answering hard questions. Now there's a debate as to whether or not that's good. But I think that the, you know, from my viewpoint, 
it's a tool just like a calculator is a tool. You know, very few schools say you have a no calculator policy once you get to a certain point in math. And I think that having something like that, that, that kind of computational power, um, apply universally to more topics is something that is only helpful. It's only it's a tool, right? And so the way that we teach will have to change. So um, that'll be important. Uh, I also think that you'll see a lot of, you know, um, to talk about how the kids might use it, the parents will probably use it um, at work. And I wouldn't be surprised if you saw it start to increasingly play a role in family life as well, where, you know, you have it, um, you know, helping to, uh, I, I can certainly imagine many cases where your, your uh, extracurricular activities and your, your calendar will be scheduled by AI for you. And um, it may help with um, identifying, you know, uh, hobbies or recipes or whatever that are especially uh, liked in your family, or maybe it'll identify issues with your home and try to automatically fix them. It's, it's I think what, one of the great things about AI is that it's going to be a lot more subtle in some ways than people think. It's there, again, as a way to augment our capabilities, not, re not completely replace the human. So quickly in our last 30 seconds, what should we fear about AI? I think people need to fear a lot less than they think they do. Um, one of the things that I deeply disagree with was, uh, you know, Elon Musk and a few others recently came out with a letter saying we should halt all AI progress for nine uh, for, for six months, and uh, I think that sets a horrible precedent. So, what should we actually fear? Well, AI is a force multiplier. Any technology is right, and so if we were to ignore it and not uh, jump on AI, not stay ahead of the game, then bad actors who are, you know, they're, they're not going to take a six month break from anything, they will get uh, ahead. So I think that the, the most dangerous thing you can do with AI is to ignore AI and pretend like it's not there or pretend like it's a bad thing. Um, the only thing to fear uh, is um, ignorance when it comes to it because you're going to be at a massive disadvantage there are some risks like i mentioned before intellectual property uh, protection making sure that there's you know that if you are the creator of something and ai use that to generate something new that that's treated equitably um but those are not things necessarily to fear they're just things they're, they're opportunities they're, they're uh, business opportunities that the industry can tackle well paul we appreciate you coming on center point uh it's a really interesting topic and uh, we hope to have you back well, TikTok is certainly not AI, and while it seems like a fun tool to a lot of young people, the real dangers of having China collect data on our children is not something we can ignore. Congressman Russ Fulcher of Idaho is working hard to do something about it, and he joins us now. Congressman, great to have you on Centerpoint. My pleasure. Thank you, and I just appreciate the opportunity to communicate with you today. Well, it's an important topic, clearly. We, we're learning about the dangers of, of TikTok. Uh, the CEO went before your committee. I would say he got smacked around a little bit by both sides. So what is coming out of this? What protections might Congress uh, enact? Frankly, I was uh, a little bit surprised to see that there was bipartisan disenchantment, if you will, with our friends at TikTok. And uh, I, I do think there is going to be some action coming out of it. Possibly an outright ban that would pass through the House. I do not think that would pass through the Senate and get signed into law. However, uh, what I do think will come out of that will be some relatively significant data privacy legislation that will pass. And that's an incredibly important step to try to get some protections for the privacy of the information that we have that uh, gets accessed online. So TikTok obviously is the most popular, but fads come and go, or maybe it's, it could be driven out of access to America. But you got Instagram Reels, uh, Snapchat, others that might be the next big thing, others in development. How do we protect the infiltration that might happen from another company? Well, I, that's a very good question, because uh, uh, just because TikTok happens to be owned and operated through, through uh, Chinese channels doesn't mean that uh, we don't have that same type of fear from American companies. The only difference is, is that potentially it's much more accessible uh, to our enemies than perhaps a Facebook or a Twitter or whatever, Instagram, that, that may be. So the bottom line is there's got to be guidelines. There's got to be transparency. You know, the other thing, Rob, is you, you combine that information with artif artificial intelligence mechanisms and the thought shaping, the tracking, the uh, consolidation of information on uh, whomever uh, are using those 
apps is just mind boggling. This is very damaging. It's damaging to adults. It's damaging to kids. And uh, it's it's uh, crying out for the need for some data privacy and some control here. I like what you had tweeted a few weeks ago. TikTok poses as a Mr. Rogers neighborhood, but it acts like Big Brother. I think that encapsulates it very, very clearly. Let me talk to you about some other really big news that was made uh, last week. The EPA, Biden administration, uh, basically trying to upend the entire auto industry by forcing in the next nine years, basically two thirds of vehicles will be electric. Um, obviously, uh, there's gonna be pushback, but if I'm gonna go out and buy a car in the next couple of years, what should I do? Can I still buy a gas car? And what's Congress gonna do to push back on this? Well, I think that, that uh, I think you will be, frankly, but uh, you, first of all, you have to grapple with what's really being pushed by this administration. They're trying to basically ban gas vehicles and and uh, push electronic vehicles. At the same time, they're attempting to ban mining and the, uh, the, the resources necessary to build the electronic vehicle. So the policies make no sense whatsoever. So on the congressional front, we're trying to do a couple of things, and I think we'll have some some success, and I certainly hope so, is put some common sense into our natural resource laws so that we can actually control the resources that are necessary for these things and knock off this war against fossil fuels in the first place. Uh, we've got a, a tremendously good record when it comes to improving our carbon emissions within this country. We're the cleanest developer in the world. And we need the all of the above energy strategy, not just to to fuel automobiles, whether they be electric or or gas powered, but to uh, power our lights and and uh, the heaters in the in the winter and the air conditioners in the summer. So we need to we need to focus on those things. That's where Congress is putting our energy right now. And unfortunately, the administration is not. And so we have to try to uh, offset that uh, through the congressional channels. Congressman, we really appreciate you coming on Centerpoint tonight, and we hope you come back. Look forward to it. Thank you for having me.